Anton interview. We've not done one of these for a while, uh, but all of a sudden Richard popped up out of the blue and said he'd be happy to do one. So I thought, that's OK. We can uh, we can find a slot. So here we are. So uh, welcome, Richard. Thanks for coming along. Just want to introduce yourself to whoever might be viewing this and let them know who you are and what you do. Yeah, by all means, I have a habit of that, just popping out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Richard Osborne. I'm the founder of Business Data Group and uh, UK Business Forums. Uh, Business Data Group is a, a platform that provides reports and analysis into what's going on in the economy for small business. And UK Business Forums is an online support community for small business owners uh, that's been going for 20 years now. Excellent, excellent. So the idea of these is to sort of like prod and poke you and sort of like work out what makes you tick and hopefully get a few uh, insights into your business journey and maybe also, you know, pick up on some advice and tips that you may give in the conversation that any business that's listening to this, you know, can take and uh, use themselves. The first question I, I like to start off with is, you know, how did you get to where you are, where you are today? What was your sort of business journey that's got you to now running the Business Data Group and the UK Business Forum? the uh that that's the way you phrase that is that's a quite a long question to answer <laughs> so i um uh, my uh business journey running running a business started in to uh, 1999 um and probably not the most orthodox way of getting into a business but i was in the middle of a nervous breakdown and um in um depression and things were collapsing around me really due to issues I'd had growing up and the I was in a situation where the job I had at the time things were falling apart with me I couldn't keep on top of the projects I was running um things that happen when you have a breakdown I couldn't face getting a job I didn't even know how to get a job well I knew how to get a job but I couldn't face applying for and doing it mm -hmm. so I left my job I had and started uh, doing website design uh, at home the uh, and that's literally was my first step into uh, running my own business, and that was yeah in 1999. And within a couple of months, at the same time, I also got married as well, which was uh, something you usually do in those sort of times as well, because starting a business isn't stressful enough. Yeah, you obviously, obviously, like a challenge, Richard. I, I do, I do. Um, to get <laughs> to get to where I am now, the, that's a bit of a sort of windy journey. Um, the web design company ended up being, I say sold, I basically lost the business to somebody in a dodgy business deal that didn't really go to plan uh, a couple of years later. And I spent a year working for this other company. And then I started another business, and uh, which I ended up selling and another business I ended up selling. And then this What Is Business Data Group started life as a company called eFiling in 2007, funded out of the money that I'd made from originally selling UK business forums in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it's all grown and involved from there. Okay. And it's, it's a, if we focus a little bit on the UK business forum, so it's a, sort of come round, I guess, full circle, one, one would say, because you've now, or recently in the last sort of few years, have brought back UK business forum. So what, 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 what was the idea, you know, having, having got rid of it a few years back and then deciding to sort of like bring it back into the fold? What was the, the reasoning and the thoughts behind that? The Well, I'll, I'll cover sort of what UK business forum stands for, because that gives some idea as to, um, yeah. sort of part of the reason why I um, sold it. So in 2003, I was in a situation where I was trying to build up a business, but I was on my own. Um, I was married, had a young daughter at the time. But what, um, and I found this to be the case with so many people, when you run your own business and you are on your own, so you don't have a board of directors or co-founders or other people to bounce ideas around or, or even not even a, a management team around you you literally are on your own you have nobody to speak to really you have nobody to sound out or nobody who's a peer in the same sort of uh, going through what you're going through who understands the worries you're having uh, and so in that situation back in those days that linked or not linked you're know, actually linkedin facebook Twitter, social media the, the term social media didn't exist and social media didn't exist as it does today. So putting up a website with a forum, as it was at the time, was the done thing. And UK Business Forums was born. And as it turned out, just by you know putting the word out there, spreading uh, on a few news groups, uh, 
emailing a few people. Eventually, what happened is it turns out there were thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands of people very quickly within the first 12 months um, who were all in the same boat. And UK Business Forms grew to the point where I think it was about 50,000 members um, all communicating online on these forums, all supporting each other. Uh, by the time I was approached by a media company in 2007 and sold them. The, and then UK Business Forums continued to grow under that media company to a point where there's about 50,000 people a day were accessing the community for help and support, peer support from each other. The, um, separately, the money from that sale funded what is today uh, Business Data Group, which is built up and running as it is. But during the COVID pandemic, two things uh, came to light. One was, um, like so many businesses during the pandemic, we um, were exposed to um, a vulnerability in the business. I don't know other way to do it, I'd say it other than literally a lot of our revenue was generated from particular sources. The no sources dried up during the pandemic. So we needed to find another way of building a business case. The other aspect was UK business forums, the people who sold it to, had already been approaching me for a couple of years saying, do we want to buy it back? Because we're going down a different tangent and we don't know what to do with UK business forums. Put all that into a big mixing blender mm. and through other work that um, I'm involved in and, what, uh, and even through networking and my involvement with the Chamber and things that have happened over recent years, uh, you see people still face the same challenges and same issues they do today as they were 20 years ago. And uh, the so needing something that supports businesses, but also looking at what is there available in the marketplace to support businesses that there isn't. Uh, so there's lots of advice out there and there's lots of support out there. But it's very scattered out across mm. many different sources. Mm. UK Business Forums is already an established brand, um, high traffic site, high membership. We've got hundreds of thousands of members within there. So let's put all those free resources and information available on that platform for people, whether it's ranging from a business plan template, a cash flow forecast template, business guides, a community on there uh, that we, um, we can just give away. And then from the business ourselves, Business Data Group has technology we built where we can monetize that basically through advertising as a short form answer. Yeah. It just all made sense to buy it back. And there is a, a sort of a sentiment there that what it, how UK Business Forums helped me when I was in a pretty dark time trying to start on my own uh, and being able to sort of, and I know it sounds so corny, but give back um, and keep that resource going for people. It just, I just wanted to buy it back. Yeah, I'm, I, I think it's something like that is, is a great resource to have because my experience is, as you, you touched on, small businesses or new small businesses tend to make the same mistakes that more established businesses made five, ten years ago. So yeah. it's like you, if you can short circuit that and have new businesses make different mistakes rather than the same ones, then, you know, hopefully the stats would be higher on, on um, you know, small bits, new business startups being uh being successful because I know the stats are still against uh, someone being successful, but that, you know those resources are out there, and UK Business Forums is a great platform to go and get that information rather than try and reinvent the wheel yourself. Um, so I, I, you know, from what you've said, you've created a number of successful uh, businesses, sold a few, bought a few back. Um, I'm not sure what your, your future plans are uh, uh, there. So I, I know there's a label that you don't like. I know some people sort of like cast on you, which is sort of like the word entrepreneur. So I thought I'd just explore that a little bit and is it, what, just sort of understand what would you prefer to be seen as and what, what is it against the entrepreneur word that, that you don't tend to like? It's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an awkward one to answer that one because I'm going to contradict myself. <laughs> uh, the, so I, uh, the problem with the word entrepreneur, in my personal opinion, and there will be people that disagree with that, and I don't mind, that's, you know, people different yeah. opinions, fine, is that it's become commoditized. So anybody, if they are in a leadership position of a business, um, the t um, everybody from government, marketing, everybody calls everybody an entrepreneur. Mm. And, and the problem is, is there are so many def different definitions of it, depending what websites you look at, dictionary mm. definition and so on, that you kind of get it why it's sort of just everybody just calls everybody an entrepreneur 
My personal definition of it is more along um, somebody who overcomes adversity to create something greater than themselves that they can pass on and bring people along with them on that journey or you know variations on that theme. Um, a somebody who is a good business person who knows how to run a business um, and you can almost like put somebody into that Here, here's a, here's a business can you run it mm-hmm. um, is a good business person and then you have the term founder as well so somebody which I used earlier somebody somebody who founded something yeah uh, so there's so many different definitions the the reason why I contradict myself but I don't like the t- term because it, it just it's just overused mm. is I can appreciate why some people turn turn around and call me an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. but it's not my place and not my right to call, as I feel, to call myself an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is is a a title that somebody else will give you. Yeah, Uh, That's how I feel about it. No, I I agree with you. I I think it is an overutilised word and, you know, people just sort of bandy it about. um, And I know people out there you know call themselves entrepreneurs but they're, they're not necessarily that successful they haven't got something that you know has a legacy that it's, it's going to be a short-lived thing so yeah i think most small businesses that are entrepreneurial you know i can sort of like get that because there is a certain spirit i think for anybody to sort of jump into this madness and start your own business <laughs> so there's got to be but yeah i, th- I think the, the entrepreneur word is something that should be bestowed on somebody rather than uh, a person claiming it for themselves but I'm sure the people out there that have a different view on it, but there you go. So, how do you see um, if you if you're looking at um, something that people are familiar with in Dragon's Den, and um, if if either of these ever watch these and watch this, and then turn around and never want to speak to me, then so it. But if you think of on Dragon's Den, the likes of Duncan Bannon Time mm. and the likes of Peter Jones, mm. both very successful people who have achieved things that I would only um, um, dream upon. Um, so not taking any of them away from them. But when you look at their backstory in the history um, of what's published, and I've read both book, uh, books on each of them, using how what definition I would use for an entrepreneur, I would assign Duncan Ballantyne as an entrepreneur with the journey that he's been through. Mm-hmm. And I would uh, say uh, Peter Jones is a very successful and very astute and clever businessman. Mm-hmm. Um, just b- by definition of adversity, overcome challenges, journey, what they've been through, based yeah. on reading both their books. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody's got their own uh, uh, interpretation. So I, I ask people, like, you're probably on, on the subject of books, you're probably familiar yeah. with Simon Sinek's um, uh I can't remember the name of the book now, but anyway, he talks about what, what is your why? So it's a really sort of like what's the driving force that gets you out of bed each morning to sort of fight fight the good fight. So what, what, what is it for you, Richard? What do you think that, that motivation the, each day is? The, uh, with anybody who runs their own business and has done for a while, uh, I would suggest that their why or their drive changes over time as they go through different stages of their life. And that's been the same for me. The reason or the why I started my very first business was out of the closest, I would say, desperation. Mm -hmm. I felt there was no other choice. uh, There was no other options open to me. um, So that was all I could do. Uh, And at that point, it was just uh, hand to mouth, day to day. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. When my daughter i've got two children now but when my first child was born my daughter that why changed like overnight it Mm. was like holy shit i've got a life to support Mm. and everything that i think back of some of the experiences i've had which um the you heard the presentation i gave on wednesday so where you know i've had time where i've lived um Mm. lived in a women's hostel to um the before my wife's parents took me in before we were sort of married um i was sleeping on some a mattress on somebody's floor with my worldly possessions in a small pile next to the mattress mm. so you think of that and various aspects of what i experienced i'm thinking i don't want my children to go through that mm. and a, a switch just went inside and my determination that i need to create something more than what's about what i'm just putting food on the table and going up and push forward the that my daughter's 20 years old now 
So yeah. hard to believe. It shocks me every time I think about it. Wow. The uh, <clears throat> And my why has evolved somewhat um, significantly now where I'm actually, um, I want this organisation, I want this business to outlive me and create an environment where I have members of the team here who can take over the reins and um, give them a platform or a, a, a something they can uh, whether grow into, take over, run, um, that's, that's not me. And mm-hmm. the and then personally, separately, I'm looking at my own life gradually over years, to, you know, coming years to step aside. And it's more, what's more important to me is supporting other businesses, whether that be even like my daughter's business, because she runs her own business now, yeah. um, or others where I can um, help others achieve what they want to achieve. The business now, you know, it's not my business. It's a vehicle to create jobs and wealth for others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because do, do you think, um, uh, it's a very broad sweeping statement, but in your experience with the small businesses that you've met and you've involved with, uh, do, do you find that they they start off with any sort of vision? You know, that they look, so you, you've created, um, Go around the houses with this. We'll get there. We'll get to the point in a minute. Um, it, you know, you, you've obviously created businesses, sold the businesses. When, when you did those, when you started them, did you think, "Oh, I'm looking to generate this to a certain amount, and in five years, I, I, I'll look for sale"? And you know, do, do you think that business owners actually have that that vision, or do they just dive in and hope for the best, and then sort of evolve as time goes forward and work out an exit strategy? Then, the for me personally. I've got somebody I uh, met many years ago as a co-director of a company that I, my first boss uh, that I spoke about on Wednesday. The, he turned around to me and said, speaking about our boss at the time, um, business owners never really make any money until they sell their business. Mm. Uh, they're always the last people to pay themselves. They mm. put everybody else's salary or salary increases in front of each other. Uh, in front of themselves so they're the last people to benefit from the success of a business and that's always stuck with me um, as sort of thinking right if I'm going to start a company I need to think about what the end game is now I've not thought about that historically in any depth other than I need to build something that has some value that somebody will buy at some point in the future and the sales I've had have been kind of opportunistic uh, Mm -hmm. that have come along but I don't make any secret uh, and everybody who works within the team here knows that this company is my pension fund my mm-hmm. retirement fund mm-hmm. the uh, so at some point i do want to retire because i don't want to be working like bless her um like the queen till the day i die I, yeah, actually, yeah. i'd like to enjoy a retirement and yeah. this business is my pension fund and i i feel being honest about that with the team but also in doing that the team here, everything, if I can create a career path for people and help them develop their own careers, their skill sets and everything around them, they're all part and parcel of that. The, based on what I've seen on UK business forums, though, not many people who start up in business start up with the end goal of exiting the business. Mm-hmm. The majority, just based on my own personal experience of who I've sp- people I've spoken to or seen or questions have been asked, start doing a business because they see something they can do to earn themselves and or the perception is to earn themselves more money or a better work-life balance than they had doing that same thing for somebody else mm, mm. just got a, a little comment from uh, mark so thanks for tuning in mark so he's uh, affirmed what you say and agrees with your views so <laughs> that vote of confidence Thank there. You, Mark. <laughs> um, so um, one, one of the questions that I sometimes ask, which I'm probably going to word a little bit differently, I guess, because I, I usually ask people what makes you different from your competitor. But I guess because you've got a number of different businesses, I guess my question to you is when you've set up these businesses, have you looked for something that has got a competitive edge or a gap in the market or something like that? Well, what led you to decide to create the business mm-hmm. created over time? The so try and think. Uh, natural. So from the beginning, it was just something I could do. So I was uh, primarily one of those people. It's something I can do. I can build a website. I can make some money doing that. If I think about where things are today, because I'm a 
massive advocate of having competition because I feel if you don't have competition, you become complacent. Mm. And there's nothing like having a bit of competition to keep you on your toes. Mm. Some people may disagree with that. And two examples of that will be, so we have a product called e-filing. Now, mm. that, that, e, that product e-filing, the, I quite, um, I will pat myself on the back a little bit, like how I've built that up. So created some technology that allowed mm. people to set up companies online. Um, was one of the very first into the U- in the UK even doing that. Grew significantly. Knew that people were going to copy me. So I gave the software away for free. Mm-hmm. That built up volume because why wouldn't you use some free software to give you a competitive mm-hmm. advantage? That's how other people started to use that technology. Then did some deals with some organizations that generated a lot of revenue and then gave that revenue, big, like a huge proportion percentage of that revenue to the people using the product. Uh, and we've saturated the market. The, it's a great position to be in, but mm-hmm. we don't have any competition at all mm-hmm. whatsoever in that market. <clears throat> so it makes it difficult to think about where to improve. Um, and the only way you get that is from the customer saying, we like a bit of this, like a bit of that. But sometimes, as we all experience, sometimes customers think they know what they want um, for, for one particular bit, but sometimes change is difficult or her own baby. So you have to try and balance across a whole range of bits of feedback and think, how do we keep innovating and developing that product mm-hmm. when there's nothing to compare it to? The when you take UK business forums, there's a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, different platforms out there that support businesses. So there you've got an opportunity to look at what and you put them in all different. We're building some. It's quite a conglomerate together of different pieces of um, a sort of content, let's call it. Mm. The uh, So we look at different places in the market and say, well, they're, they're leading in that, they're leading in that. And you can then innovate and think, well, how can we improve on that? How can we improve on that? And that's great because then you have got something to compare it to. And if somebody does something better than you, like, ah, oh, slept on me laurels. I need to keep keep yeah. uh, keep my game up. Uh, yeah. And I, I like that sort of challenge. I like that bit of competition that sort of keeps pushing you forward and not I don't, you know it's, it's nothing worse than being complacent and lazy in an industry and, th- and then the innovation doesn't happen yeah well when, when i started running my network groups it, it was very much you know to have it be an open network so there is no lockout any, any business is welcome and i believe that a bit of healthy competition you know, it doesn't go amiss. It has you sort of like hone your message, hone your game, you know, make sure you know what is going to distinguish you from your competitors. But also I think it's in pretty much every sector, I've seen collaboration between seemingly on paper competitors. So Mark Costa, who commented earlier, um, is very much collaborative. He's worked with other graphic designers. They've shared work between each other. Whereas, you know, on paper, they're they're both doing the same thing, but it doesn't work that way. And I think that it's... I think competitors can work together, so it's healthy for both both sides. I think so. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with well, you. It's the same analogy on the high street. So you'll have a lot of food locations on mm. the high street um, because then they bring everybody to the yard. To quote song, but they yeah. Um, yeah. they bring the sort of the passing trade all together. Yeah. And many people have particular niches. So talking about graphics designers, um, as you know, the only exam result I really got to know is art and design. I can do a wonderful watercolour painting or charcoal <laughs> drawings. Um, everything else I've had to learn since I left school. The, but every, um, so I have a particular skill set when it comes to de- design, but not other areas. So by working together, competitors can bring each other's businesses along, increase their profits, increase the opportunities that are open to them. Whereas they may normally turn somebody away. Where if they work in collaboration, yeah. the everybody benefits from it. I would yeah. just say word of advice is just make sure um, you know, the, there's a. I disagree with this statement in, in, to its full extent, but to a degree, no friends in business. Some people turn around and say that. I slight, I disagree with that to a degree, but you do have to protect yourself. So if you're going to work in collaboration with somebody, yeah. then have some form of written agreement or contract in place between you that protects the both of you mutually between you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and Mark has, has done that, you know, with the relationships he builds with the people he works with. He has that in place so people are clear how the how the structure is. So, yeah, absolutely. Don't, whatever you do, sort of don't wing it, I guess, is what you're saying. Otherwise, yeah. it might, uh, might not work out for you. So um, if you weren't busy enough, um, I know because our paths have crossed um, uh, on, char on charitable uh, uh, work. So do you want to say a little bit about, again, what inspired you to get involved with charities, the type of charities you're involved with? now i think you're you're a trustee or, or something of maybe your own charity we'll find out about that so yeah, just tell us a little bit about your, your so, charity journey so um as many people will see you, you there are a lot of charities out there and you, you can walk through the town particularly this time of year and there are so many good causes that anybody can support and my some advice that was given to me many years ago was pick the causes you want to stick to and stick to them because you can't help everybody and then you'd end up giving away any of your income and anything like that. You just wouldn't be able to cope. Mm -hmm. uh, so pick what your causes are and stick to them and do them well. The two causes that I support personally are related to young people with special needs or learning difficulties and uh, disengaged youth or dis uh, disenfranchised youth. Uh, the latter ones I'll come on first because that's where our paths have crossed yeah. is like yeah. a charity used to be called Youth at Risk. Yeah. Uh, great. They haven't done anything in this region lately, which I have dropped them a line about. Yeah. Uh, so I've ended up doing some of that personally where people have known me or approached me directly saying, you know, if there's a young person here, would you support them or mentor or coach them? And this is really um, young people who often are uh, identified by um, social services, the local authority or the schools, or maybe out of school, who are at risk of exclusion or maybe have been excluded from school and getting in with the wrong cat crowds, to use that kind of expression. Yeah. The What I hope to do, and it's always hope to do, you can never, but what I try to do whenever I'm working with young people there is to uh, inspire them, I almost cringe saying that word, but it is to try and inspire them to focus on a path ahead of them that takes them down a legitimate, potentially business route. And my thinking there is the people who think differently, who challenge the norm, and often these are where these children might be considered the troublesome ones in school, they're the diff people who think differently. And I would argue are the entrepreneurs of tomorrow who really do um, shake up industries, um, create great businesses by just breaking the mold around it. But ultimately, these are uh, often within schools where the young people are just disengaged with everything around them and need somebody who will be that person they can rely on. So thinking about the, the grit training we've both been through, where quite often these young people have never had an adult that they can rely upon, never mm. have an adult who's actually going to listen to them, mm. let them have their voice be heard and talk through whatever it is with them. And the sort of coaching work that we do within grit or I do independently is sitting down with these young people <clears throat> two ears one mouth listen to them mm. go through talk and and you don't it's what i love about that kind of work is there's no wrong mm. it's just what do you want where do you want to take yourself let's do, work through those different options in front of you uh, and just get them to um think differently about their lives their future and you know the reality is there you could uh, speak to 10 of them and you may only break through with three or four of them mm. but um you still keep chipping away at that uh, yeah. and that's my reason behind that is i was one of those kids mm. and i my life was turned around by a number of things a big part was played by a small business owner who invested in me mm. the other aspects the learning difficulties and special needs uh that came around um because <laughs> i was um this is before the local enterprise partnerships that exist now. And I was basically asked by local enterprise partnership, we're looking at piloting a project for that the government's thinking might roll out nationally. Um, it's connecting businesses with schools and there's a special needs school that's applied. Um, based your 
got experience with working with young people, you're the most experienced person working with young people in the network we've got, um, would you work with a special needs school? school? And I was quite unnerved by that because I had these preconceived ideas of what special needs actually meant. Um, As it happens, jump forward a couple of years from there, um, my son ended up being diagnosed with dyslexia and high-functioning autism, and we went through a whole load of heartache there fighting Mm. for support. He ended up going to the school for a couple of years where I was volunteering as an enterprise advisor, as it was there. And now I'm a, well, I'm actually vice chair of governors at that um, school and I've got very involved in there. Mm. And it's really, as soon as I started to get involved and I actually got to see how difficult it is for young people with learning difficulties to get into any form of meaningful work, employment, the opportunities are just closed off to them. Mm. The statistics are heart-wrenching. And it just became, this is a wrong. This is just completely wrong. And I just got more and more involved in it. And the as an individual and as a company, we support um, organisations like TRAC for support, supporting mm-hmm. autistic people into work. Uh, as an employer, the I would welcome anybody with um, any particular learning difficulties or special needs um, into employing them here. The And my ambition in the work that I do there is to improve the employability and career opportunities for people with learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. And the work that Northgate School, which is where I'm a governor of, um, is fantastic. But it's not just, you know, I've I've become connected with a number of schools and people within the local community who do such great work there. And that's where I focus my energies on those two channels. I, mean, I, I certainly concur with what you said. You know, my, my experience when I, I started with youth at risk, as it was back in the nineties, um, and you know, at the time, I got no experience of, of working with with young people. Uh, one of my colleagues that, that I used to work with, he'd done one of the first programs in the UK. Took us along to an open evening. Uh, you know, I wasn't given anything back at that at that point. Um, you know, just sort of purely focused on, on my own selfish self. Um, but yeah, I, I got involved with it, and you know what you touched on earlier is that you know these kids just need a focus because my first program was down in Sutton uh, and there used to be a group called the Sutton Posse which were basically robbing everything and causing chaos um, and the police weren't able to handle it and uh, yeah we managed to get some of the young people that were involved in that and the irony is you know to run a posse by the sort of by the sort of suggested name of it you need leadership skills you know someone was the leader and they were leading that 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 gang you know we were quite you know, would demonstrate some quite good managerial and leadership skills, but the focus was obviously not in a in a thing that's going to contribute to society. And you know, all all a lot of these kids need is just some direction and refocusing, so they realise that their skills can be used el- elsewhere, and they don't need to be dragged down necessarily by the the environment or the community in which they've been uh, uh, brought up. You know, they've got a choice in it; they can choose something different. And as you say, it just isn't going to impact every single person that you that you touch, but hopefully, it will make a difference difference to enough that it um you know that it has their lives be better going forward so yeah you know anybody listening to this if you're not involved in some sort of charity work I found it very fulfilling it helped me with my coaching skills my communication skills my facilitation skills none of which are obviously showing up today so I've obviously failed but um you know I I learned hell of a lot and I, I was lucky that I got the companies that I was working for to actually give me unpaid leave to go along with some of the residential courses that that um, youth at risk used to run in those days, and that that in itself was quite something that's quite unheard of in my day for companies to sort of look at the what's now known as sort of CSR corporate social responsibility to do that. And that whereas now I know companies do encourage their staff to take time off and go and contribute so many days a year. So you know that 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 was something. Well, we that, give people paid leave to go and excellent. work for a charity that is important to that individual so i don't dictate to my staff you have to support this charity or that charity but we do give them paid leave um uh, effectively like additional holiday but that holiday has to be used for working within a charity and i won't embarrass her in case she's um watching this yeah but picking up on your comment about developing your leadership skills the the training that, that you're familiar with how intense the training is for grip youth yeah. at risk and that changed my own management style mm-hmm. and one of my team uh, 
complimented me on my management style and said, how can I learn to manage in the style that you do? And the words are on that. And I recommended uh, Grit and also, in fact, I'm actually got a contact with Tony who does the training at Grit um, as part of this team development and training we do here. Mm. That's how much it's helped my business and also my own engagement and way that I engage with my staff and people that work for me. Um, I apply that same coaching techniques as a management style. Mm. Well, I was certainly the David Brent, I think, when I was a manager way back when. So I've learned, <laughs> learned, learned some things, uh, you know, from my involvement with it. And I think, you know, most people that do get involved in charities do actually get something back from it. So um, at the time of recording, you know, the, the last couple of years have been a nightmare for most businesses, having gone through the, the challenge of COVID, a sort of recession sort of like potentially uh, imminent i think we'll know next quarter whether we're in a recession inflation etc yeah. etc you know the small business have had quite a lot to face well what are, outside of covid per se what would you say is the biggest challenge that you've uh, faced on your journey today the on me personally um the i'd probably say most of them are of my own doing from a lack of knowledge or experience and just sort of like i'm gonna give it a go the um, the things that impacted me the most, where things really went, um, where I felt things have just gone bad, um, have generally been around not having people around me to sort of act as a sounding board or accountability or here. So when I think back to before UKBF, the reason for that is the I was just trying everything, trying to see what, you know, hope throw enough um things out there and something might stick and just sort of flailing around and not having a network to speak to or support and networks can work in so many different ways whether it is a business community such as yours Paul, your UK business forums mm-hmm. um, networking groups themselves uh, there's various ways out there but actually having other people to sound check for Mm -hmm. today i have a board of directors so it's my board meeting this coming friday um so i'm frantically putting together my mi management information my exec Mm -hmm. summary and things i had to literally say this is i'm doing guys they uh right they um and they've been great for me as it is uh, in today's world but when i go back and think about some of the mistakes i've made it's because i've literally just been winging i remember once um, I got suckered into paying £10,000 for an advert in a magazine, uh, which included 200 copies of the magazine for me to just be, what am I going to do with 200 copies? <laughs> I got suckered into it. And then these big boxes of this magazine just appeared at uh, the office. Yeah. My wife went mental, said, where are you spending it? And we couldn't really afford it. But uh, the I just didn't run it past anybody. Mm. The, um, the Yeah, I think the biggest issue I've had in the past or the mistakes I've had are times where I've literally tried everything and had no focus. Yeah. Uh, the And having people around you, you it could just be equal business owners, friends, you can build in contacts you make, you just say, can I sound you out on something? And yeah. you support each other. It really doesn't matter what shape it takes, but somebody to stop you just losing focus on what you're trying to do and end up trying everything and being a master of nothing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, so if you are a small business out there, you haven't got a board, you haven't got sort of people around you, go and find them. You know, m- most people that are, that run their small businesses, I think the majority will find time to help you or advise you. You know, just look at somebody that you can. I've, I've used you historically, Richard, you know, to sort of sit as a sounding board. Um, and it's useful to people, someone to tell you, you know, don't do that. It's a totally ridiculous thing to do, you know. And and I think from that point of view, you know, certainly over the last couple of years, what I've found really useful is, is I've been doing a virtual pub, which funny enough still exists, even though we're back to be able to go face to face. And I think nearly everybody on that, they were all small business owners. And I think everybody on that has found that a useful forum, particularly during the sort of like the COVID years, if you like, to bounce ideas off of and sort of get some feedback and, um, you know, ask the questions in a friendly environment but with an environment where they are actually going to um, uh, tell you 
directly help things on. So there's always a danger of getting into an echo chamber if you're familiar, if people are familiar with that that expression where you'll just hear what you want to hear, which doesn't help. So Nothing getting, worse than an echo chamber. No, so, so it's getting that balance really of, of those people around you that I know are going to be challenging and are just going to be yes people that are going to, you know, to fully sort of comprehend what, what you're asking them and what you're trying to do so yeah th th those people are out there you know if you, if you haven't got those people go and go and find them so be, so just uh the last few things then so if you were to give one top tip for any business out there of, of your uh, experience today what, what what would that be if you were to pick one the i think a sort of a, a an elongated piece of advice really is the first of you know if you're going to start a business then your first step has to be you've got to be totally committed to it there's um i've, I've listened to a fantastic uh, spoken word artist called suli briggs who gave a talk once well, spoken word uh talking to parents about if you're always focusing and telling your child to have a backup plan what you're basically telling them is you don't have confidence in their um mm -hmm. aspect their dream and, and I would always say, let me insert a caveat here. It depends where you are in your life. Because if you've got mortgages and kids support, then your sort of risk appetite's a little bit different. So putting that caveat to one side, put everything into your dream, your focus, and then make sure you are committed to it. So your why, like what you asked me earlier, has to be so strong because it is going, you're going to hit all sorts of obstacles and challenges. And there's going to be times where you're going to sit there and feel like, why have I done this? What am I doing? And you have to have the strength to get over those. Mm -hmm. And then alongside that, um, connect with some other people in a similar boat to you in whichever platform that says. Now, I would naturally plug UK Business Forums as an yeah. online platform because I'm wearing the colours and that sort of thing. Yeah. But there are others out there. As said, Paul, you've got business community and the mm -hmm. virtual pub you mentioned there. So the, connect yourself with some other business owners who are – in a similar boat to you or have been there mm. and work with them as a sounding board as peers, whether that's over a pint or however much be to help you keep on focused on what you're doing, because the danger, especially in the early stages of business is to try and do whatever you can to pay the bills, mm -hmm. go off on so many different tangents that then not only do you lo lose focus on what you're trying to build and what you're trying to achieve, but so do your customers lose sight of actually what is it you do? Mm -hmm. Because if your message isn't clear, what it is that you actually provide, what your service is, because you do a little bit of everything, then people end up using you for nothing because they just won't. Customers, buyers need to be able to pigeonhole you in. I, if I need that product or service, that's where I go. And it needs to, you need to make it easy for them. So if mm -hmm. you're going off in all different tangents, you'd end up with no customers because nobody will know what it is you do. So find yourself some peers that you can um, who support each other. Uh, say I can plug UK Business Forums for that or Business Community uh, as well as others. <clears throat> um, and so you've got people to, that are in the same boat as you that you can build a relationship up and supporting each other uh, and keep your focus on what you're doing and have a strong enough why or drive to get you through the difficult times if you don't if you find yourself thinking of throwing in the towel in the first six months then your dr uh, drive wasn't strong enough to really do it and yeah, yeah you some know. people some people it's not right it's not for them yeah i, I think you've got to have a resilience and a tenacity as a, as a, as a small business owner and definitely a focus um, you know, because you're never quite sure what's going to be thrown at you next. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and having that support network around, I think, is important. So, what, what one? Um, oh, Mari's just uh, uh, popped up. I know you know Mari quite well. So, <laughs> in the car, it's on hands free. <laughs> yeah, stop, stop steering with your knees, Mari. Um, so, oh uh, yeah. So, one, one final thing before we finally uh, uh, wrap up. Then you mentioned before we came live, you've got your own podcast. So, do you t want to tell people? what it's called, where to find it, and literally what, what that's about, why they should tune in. The, the, well, the, it's called Drive, the Small Business Podcast from UKBF, and it's available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, um, TuneIn, basically wherever you get your podcast from. If you search Drive Small Business Podcast, it should come up there with my mug on it with a um, blue background, which is actually the barn door of my daughter's business um, the, uh, on there. 
And really um, what it's about, the thing that um, I, I am fascinated, but also have such admiration for small business owners because they make up 98, 99% of the entire, like all businesses in the country. And the thing that nobody really would realize is you could be standing in the queue at the news agents or at the petrol station and the person in front of you, behind you, could be a small business owner. They may have five, 10, 15 staff um, and then they're sitting there waiting to pay for their petrol. But in the forefront of their mind, they're sitting there thinking, if I don't get that invoice in, if I don't sort that, I've got 10 people's wages I've got to pay at the end of the month and I haven't got the money in the bank to pay it. And they're going through all these challenges or more often than not with the guests that I speak to on the podcast, I hear stories of where they've gone through such adversity in uh, throughout their lives and starting the business was like as I said earlier for myself is the only choice open to them the only thing that they felt that they could do to fix something that was broken in their lives and they do that and then they bring people along on that journey with them and they're fascinating stories and there's been a couple of them where I found myself getting feeling quite emotional as they're talking about what they've been through and yet when you the news stories you see in the media paints a very different picture of business owners Mm. and there's a general public perception out there that if you run your own business you're minted you're rolling in it you've got an easy life you're you know you're you're slacking you've got all your lackeys doing all your work for you because you've just got the life of Riley and that's so much further from the truth Mm. that I just this podcast um, exists to actually tell the story of small business owners not the big celebrities you see on tv and things like, but actual real people that you'd walk past in the street you'd meet uh, without even realizing it at the petrol station the supermarket and what they go through to create these businesses and to create careers and jobs and opportunities for people mm-hmm. um, and some of the stories have just blown me away so mm-hmm. yeah it's a drive a small business podcast wherever you get your podcasts um you're from wherever you listen apple spotify that um i'd encourage anybody to have a listen and listen to what the real stories are that make up say 98 99 percent of all companies in the uk and what they go through no that it's, 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 it's every fortnight isn't it richard did you say that every fortnight out, yeah does it come out at a particular time day or the it comes uh, if we get our timing right on the technology, sure. um, it comes out at the early hours of the morning every Tuesday. Uh, sorry, every other Tuesday. Yeah. So the um, the next episode coming out next week um, is a young lad. I say young lad. I can say that. Yeah, because I'm nearly fifty. Uh, a young lad <clears throat> who um, started up an online accounting platform and a bank um, just to. Um, because he just felt that he could. And even though everybody was telling him not to do it, mm. he still went ahead and did it. And the story, the latest episode that was just came out last week was a lady called Jo, who, such a compelling story. She went into, she met somebody at um, uh, prenatal classes. They ended up becoming friends. Their children ended up being born on, could you figure it, on the same day, mm. and went into business together. And then her friend was hit with, she's had had a couple of challenges, which are part of the story, but when her friend was hit with a completely debilitating illness um, that attacked her brain to the point where she was unable to walk, talk, feed herself. And um, then she had, her friend had to learn all those skills again. And they mm-hmm. had they're a team of people, a business, they're in business together. She, she had to help her friend and keep the business afloat. And these are sent such an unassuming lady that you wouldn't even notice in the street or um, in the queue at, mm. in the shop. Mm. Um, the fascinating stories. Yeah, I, I think listening to you know, if you like, real business owner stories, you, you, you're always going to get something from that. So, uh, so thanks for the plug, Richard. Thanks for your time today. I appreciate you're Thank a busy you. man, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, hopefully we've covered quite a bit of ground that anybody watching this live or on the replay will will find useful. So we'll end it there.